And uh, I work on CEDRUS, helping to develop spatial reference model. I have another project for the Army, in which I'm building super high-speed algorithms for doing coordinate transformations. It's not a subject that we're going to talk about here, but it's going to be good stuff that will be coming out. My name is Paul Burkle, the Mitre Corporation, Biotechnical Support, CEDRUS, and a number of other uh, Army and Joint MS programs. Your next, sir. We're doing introduction. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm right. And, and, and what we'd really like to know is what your interests, your application interests are. Application domain. Go ahead. Uh, Rob Kaplowitz, I'm with the Army Tank Automotive Research and Development Center. Application is embedded training in ground combat vehicles. <clears throat> Eckhart Heineken, Joey Nerdfors. I'm a database producer and user of uh, databases for flight applications in uh, modern flight simulators. I guess we're going this way. Uh, I'm Jay Ashton Bacic for TRW. I'm involved in the district transition training application and coordinate transformation. Using coordinate transformation during data consumption and production. Okay. Do data consumption. Let's go right here. <coughs> I'm John Gillis from uh, NEMA, National Injury Mapping Agency. Uh, I'm a scene visualization database producer and interested in CEDRUS as a mechanism for exchanging uh, some of this data. I'm Earl Miller. I'm also from NEMA, but I'm assigned to the USO and We build the databases for the Special Operations Forces. So we're looking at the subjects as maybe as a man change to get to other some of those. Rob Whitman, I work for the Meyer Corporation. I'm supporting a number of different programs, uh, simulation programs for the Army and Joint uh, programs. And Bob Bowling, I also work for MITRE and uh, working with the Jason's program and Air Force's Distributed Mission Training Program. Uh, Jack Jordan with uh, BMH Associates and uh, we're a user of computer generated forces, uh, databases, joints out. Uh, Mike Pastore from Army Night Vision Labs. And, uh, Production of Andy, <coughs> Andy Jacobs, I'm with him. <laughs> Tony from and a member of the management group for the Secrets program at Stratcom. If we do, so she takes friends, uh, we are new associates of CEDRIS. What we are in the process to make our database generation system compatible with CEDRIS. I guess Kevin, you're next. Uh, uh, Kevin Trott from Park Government Systems. Uh, I'm a Citrus associate, and I also uh, chair the CISO SRM product development group, which all of you should join immediately. I'm Casey Eason from TNO. I'm working on simulation development using terrain data. I'm Glenn Michelson, Lockheed Martin Corporation, and uh, currently working for the Theater Air Command and Control Simulation Facility in Albuquerque. The reason we did that is we want to kind of know if you were military or any of the DOD oriented or what. Okay, partly. Okay, I need uh, somebody to push a button. That's me. Now, which one of these do I push? You all have read this. Don't be offended if I skip some charts. Uh, and go through them rapidly because they're in your packet uh, and you can read them because we have a lot of material to cover today and not so much time to do it. I'm going to start this off with sort of a motivation. That relates to simulation interoperability. In the good old days, some of you heard uh, Duncan Duke Miller talk Ralph, yesterday. We take five. Um, sorry, I, I'm sitting on the side and realize. Okay, we're off and running, I guess. Good morning to you all. Let's go to the next chart. You all have this in your packet and have read it, so we don't need to belabor it. What you're going to get out of this course is the outline. I'm going to do this first section. Paul Burkle's going to do several other sections. Then I'm going to pick up some, then Paul's going to finish up. And I said before, don't be offended if we race through a couple of the charts that, because you have them in your packet. Could I have the next slide, please? I'm going to talk about how we kind of got into this business, and that has to do with simulation interoperability. 
Older legacy models, some of you heard Duke give his historical uh, discussion yesterday in the plenary session, didn't have much in them. They had big blobs, locations weren't very good, sometimes location didn't have any up. He talked about being two-dimensional, and some of the views, for instance, of the graphics were from 20,000 feet. Uh, we've had to start worrying about not only that there are systems out there, but where are they, and what are their location, and as we get into joint modeling and more uh, uh, highly resolved modeling, we got to worry about what else is out there, namely the environment, and the environment isn't just terrain. The environment is smoke, dust, uh, radiation effects, all kinds of physical phenomena. It's very important that you define a consistent spatial reference framework for interoperability for the very reason that Duke talked about yesterday, to get a level playing field. If you don't have all of the nodes in the interoperable simulation at roughly the same level of resolution, you may give a decided disadvantage to one side or the other. I may be able to see you and you can't see me. And in the uh, resulting fight, that's bad for you. This has to be done at all levels of simulation, uh, resolution, aggregated, entity level, constructive, virtual, and live. Can I have the next slide? Now it's the interfaces between each of these uh, simulation classes that makes interoperability difficult. Uh, Duke talked about highly aggregated simulations, trying to hook them up and fight against detailed entity level simulation. That's virtually impossible to do. We've done it, but the results don't really make any sense unless you have somehow managed to uh, get environmental models that are right. Now the traditional hierarchy of models doesn't work very well because they take models that were built for simulation by n different people and try to put them together and the coordinate systems are different the model, the sub-models are different, the way the environment is represented is different, and it doesn't work very well. A major uh, problem in the commonality of interfaces is that the uh, that different Earth reference models and coordinate systems are used all over the place. We're going to go into a, some detail about that. And it's fairly easy to interface uh, entity level models, but getting entity level models to interface with aggregated models is very difficult. This interface has been uh, referred to as the Grand Canyon problem. I'll uh, come back to that idea in a minute. I, I made a whack at laying out a spectrum of models on this chart ranging from low, low level of detail to high level of detail I almost said resolution or fidelity, and we don't want to say those words. So this is low level of detail, high level of detail. This way is scope, squad to army, if you like, or big units. These are the aggregated constructive models that some of you are familiar with. They tend to be closed models, that is, they're not interactive, although some are. Units are usually big, battalions are higher. Lots of aggregation. If there's any environmental representation at all, it's in some formula over some large hexagon. Attrition is almost always based on Lanchester differential equation. Over here, here are uh, all the entity level models. There are sets of models here that are called constructive entity level model. They're closed for analysis, interactive for training and planning. They have some stochastic effects in them. They have much more detailed environment. You do that uh, model acquisition, more specifically. And you always have 2D graphics, sometimes with a 3D graphics display. We have tactical simulators like CCTT or SimNet. Uh, they're virtual, always interactive. Virtual means they have a wraparound view of the world on some graphics display system. These are quite different. This is like looking down on a chessboard. And this is what, like sitting on top of a pond and looking out at the chessboard, in analogy. They're principally at this point for training. They generally emphasize 3D graphics and show 2D to the outside. They're 
principally distributed. Usually the OP4 is uh, constructive and automated. There are a lot of protocol standards because of the distribution. DIS is one of them. We also have another kind of entity level simulation that we deal with, and that's ranges and live exercises. We have training systems in which people fly airplanes and shoot at each other, top gun kind of thing. The main difference here is there are people flying real platforms, but the weapon delivery is emulated. Clearly, it wouldn't be good to shoot live weapons in our training exercise. And then there's war. War has simulations in it, too. You have to simulate where the bomb would go if I released it right now in order to do the aiming. So there are embedded simulations all over the place. Can I have the next slide? Lots of detail doesn't imply high fidelity, by the way. I took a whack at taking some of the legacy models and laying them out on the same kind of chart. Low level of detail, high level of detail, squad to theater, and there are familiar names in here. Some of you probably are familiar with some of these. Sim, Thunder, CBS, Taxim, Vic, Eagle, and so on. There may be some argument about where I place these. There's not much argument that they're aggregated. Well, the constructive models, Cast Forum, Joint Conflict Model, Janus, Yadsim, JCATS, ModSAF, CCTTSAF are here. Now, people that look at this say, well, look, we can play a division. This, this chart doesn't address hooking a bunch of these together to make a bigger war. It just addresses what the node itself can do. And of course, you have tactical simulators. Simulators are things that people sit in. And there are a bunch of these similar kind of things. This particular product, you sit in a tank and you shoot at other tanks. And there's laser uh, engagement systems that allow you to know whether you hit them or not. And of course, I talked about embedded fire control. And then I kind of have sort of this tail down here. There's lots of engineering, detail engineering simulations out there. Can I have the next slide? And this is sort of a picture of the, the Grand Canyon problem. And try to interface these simulations. This is a notional chart that says it's very difficult to hook constructive models at the entity level, any of them, to aggregated models. That canyon's really big. Why is that? Well, there are no bumper numbers over here, and there are bumper numbers over here. Over here, people get killed in half tank units, or three quarters of a tank unit, or something like that. They don't over here. Environment's highly aggregated. There's a little difference here in interfacing these things in that a person is sitting in the tank making decisions that that's the thing I want to shoot at, squeezing the trigger. Whereas over here, a person's only telling tanks where to go on a flat screen display, 2D display, and an automated system is saying, I'll shoot now when I'm close enough, or it's a threat. There's a fairly deep canyon here, and this is to emphasize the fact that to the left of this, it's all pure simulation, and we know ground truth, or we can know ground truth. We can say, that's ground truth. Over here, we can't measure where the darn airplane is very accurately. We can't measure where the tank barrel is pointed very accurately. There are people that think they can, but they can't. And trying to figure out where a bullet would have went out of a tank round at a moving target, and what the missed distance is, over here is very hard, and over here is easier. Not simple, but easier. That is a fundamental problem that's going to block us from hooking tactical simulations to, or, or constructive simulations to live ranges and exercises. And you've got to do it right, because somebody might get killed if you do it wrong. And of course, there's a difference between war and live exercises, which you can imagine, has something to do with fear factors and stuff. Hey, fact, yeah. Ralph, is it, so the, the axis there is sort of a level of hardness or difficulty, is it? Uh, no, this is level of detail. This I mean, no, no, the level oh, of this way. I don't know what that is. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> this is a picture made for generals and managers, okay? And by the way, I've given this lecture a lot of times over the last five, six years. I used to work at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and I'd get these high-level guys coming from uh, England or someplace, four stars. I, they call them generals, I guess. 
this is the only chart they wanted to take away from my beautiful pitch. <laughs> and, uh, and, but it, it's good because it, it leaves you with the impression of hardness, harder, hard, but not so hard. Oh boy, that's really deep. There's something going on there I don't understand. But it's not anything other than a notional thing. We have the next one. Now, why do we need a spatial reference model? We've mattered at it. There's no consistency in the treatment of Earth model. We need consistency for a joint distributed simulation in order to get a reasonably level playing field and to support the DNA. It'd really be hard to do validation, verification, and accreditation if these things are at various levels. There's a lot of different Earth models being employed by a lot of different application domains. Um, dynamics formulations relate to the Earth model, where gravity is pointed, where the vectors point, the complexity of the equations. Acquisition modeling. When you have different Earth models, again, we have the problem of I can see you and you can't see me because we have different representations of the terrain surface, for instance. And then one of my heartburns is after you build all this stuff, some programmer, without telling you, makes approximations, further approximations, in the computation in order to achieve runtime speed. And sometimes it's hard to even find out those are in there. You've probably all seen that. We need some kind of standard to promote lossless and accurate transformations and representations of Earth reference model. And as an example, that's, that's plagued the community for a long time, it's just nomenclature, the way we speak about things. Here's a whole bunch of terms, altitude, elevation, height, geodetic height, ellipsoidal height, and on and on and on, that people use. They're all different, mostly, and they all have specific meanings. And so we need to write down somewhere what the meanings really mean, so we don't have one guy putting one kind of height in and somebody else putting another kind of height in. We need to have all of the common coordinate frameworks that are in common usage. We've got to tie these into a common framework and do things like we're doing today, educate systems users, systems developers. What is a horizontal datum? What's a vertical datum? Accuracy. Generally, we need higher and higher accuracy, higher than for C4 ISR. We need it for a couple of reasons. One is when you're emulating a a tank round flying out, missing the turret ring by a half a meter is not good. You really need more precision than a half a meter. You need millimeter precision. Furthermore, if you're going to do VBNA, ground truth has to be modeled very accurately in order to know that your model is inaccurate, right? Plus, now we have GPS and other systems and we can find things on the surface of the Earth to a centimeter. We can almost do blind bombing now. A guy flies out and drops a bomb on the lat lawn and hit it. We couldn't do that before. Performance. You're never fast enough. One of the reasons we get people fiddling with the codes and making them run faster because it's never fast enough. Speed relates to how many entities you can simulate how many nodes you can have in a simulation, and how much fidelity you have. There are increasing requirements in the real world to turn around simulations very rapidly. If we're in a, in a real war situation and a field commander wants to know, hey, he gets a new weather report, he said, boy, it's going to rain, what's this going to do to me, how, what should I do? He wants to rerun the simulation to find out what the policy should be, but he has to rerun the whole environment. There has to be a turnaround then, it's very rapid. And then uh, programs like CCTT use a protocol to send information back and forth to locate people. So I'm living in my little world and you're living in your little world, in our dead reckoning world, so to speak. And I need to tell you where I am and you need to tell me where you are. And there in DIS, for instance, the protocol uh, communication standard is to do that in XYZ coordinates, or centered Earth fix, which we call geocentric coordinates. 
Problem is, I'm in the model, I might be in universal transverse Mercator. So I have to first convert to XYZ in order to send you the information, and you're sitting over there in Lambert conformal, so you have to convert that back to you. About 20% of the computer time involved in these simulations is devoted just to that process. So there's a real benefit to making these fast. It's really important to know who you can interact with when you're on the battlefield. Who you can see. It's not just a matter of closeness, it's a matter of who can you see. That's, that brings into, all, all, into consideration all, com all components of the environment. So, a complete, and I use this example a lot, of people think that because they have line of sight to, a, to something, they can see it geometric line of sight, or, or intervisibility in that sense. But I might very well not even be looking at you. I might be in a tank with my, my uh, vision system pointed in another direction. You gotta worry about angles, you gotta worry about elevation angle. You must do the intervisibility right. And there's lots of people who worry about gravity. We were at one time not worrying all, about all the very, very detailed gravity models until we got hooked up with somebody from the Navy who said, when my Polaris missile comes out of the water, it's got to be oriented exactly with the gravity vector. I've got to know where the gravity vector is. Because the energy loss, if it comes out, well, not tilted, but tilted in your planning system, can cost you a lot of downrange accuracy. We need all these things, but Conversions between common systems don't preserve a lot of these, and that's what this lecture is all about. Let me have the next chart. You've got this kind of data, who doesn't? It's a very complex topic, especially if you're going to interchange databases taken in different systems. This is not unique to modeling and simulation. There's lots of commercial applications of people doing things like uh, uh, looking at the Earth from space and then zooming in on it. There is a lot of action right now. That's what Steve and Dick are, are doing here, is educating all of us on, on uh, our attempts or our movement toward becoming an international standard. This is the draft standard for the spatial reference model that we're working on right now. There are some URLs that you can go look at and get infinite detail about this stuff. And now here's Paul. That's just sort of an introduction, motivation. Okay. Next slide. I'm going to introduce some basic terminology, but I want to remind you of the scope of our interest here. Ralph has given you the basic view of one perspective of scope. I'm going to give you a different perspective, an environmental perspective. Uh, one of the important perspectives we need to understand is a lot of interesting things happen out there, environmentally speaking, that aren't very close to the surface of the Earth. So even though I think we're all pretty comfortable with uh, geographic information system technology and maps, examples over on the side, these are all basically designed to characterize locations and information related to locations, but generally near the surface of the Earth. Uh, as part of the environment, we need to be able to support the domains uh, not only of, uh, of the terrain and the ocean, but also the domains of the atmosphere and what's sometimes called space weather. This is an example of a number of interesting things or systems that we put out there uh, at differing altitudes, uh, certainly up to uh, geosynchronous uh, and beyond. In fact, space weather folks will tell you that they're interested in everything down to uh, or up to the corona of the sun. Some examples here of the types of information one might be acquiring that would be environmental in nature and would need to be precisely located. Next slide. Uh, you probably heard that we've solved the mapping problem. Uh, back in January, we flew an interesting uh, space transportation system uh, mission on the shuttle, and we acquired all the data we're ever going to need that describes the surface of the Earth. Well, that's at least what my local paper said. It's not quite that good yet, but we're getting some very interesting data. Now, the point to this picture is, what spatial reference frame do you think that data was collected in? And the answer is it wasn't collected in the one that related to this particular object down here. 
which was the nature of the data, if you will, the purpose for collection of the data. The data was collected with respect to a spatial reference frame that related to this axis here, and an axis that went along the body, and then a third axis that was perpendicular to those two. That was the frame in which the information was collected. Now, of course, the information is going to be processed, and over some period of time, we'll get the information back for use in our community in terms of a spatial reference frame that's related to that Earth's surface. But there are interesting data sets started here and ended up here, which need to be described in other frames than perhaps uh, the geodetic system that we may receive the data in finally. Next slide. I'd like to point out that even when we talk about the narrower view of the world, we think about projections and mapping, not all projections are geodetic. So some of you already know the answer to this question, but think about it. What, what am I showing you here? Very good, but he already knows because he didn't get it the first time. <laughs> The point is, this is a Mercator projection, and it's not geodetic, it's marchodetic, or whatever. Now, in fact, if you go talk to the folks at NASA, and we have, what's that geo term mean? Well, geo means Earth. So what do you call it? We call it Martian geology, okay, and lunar geology. We do not call it selenology or something of that form. So we will use the term geo, but we will not bind geo to be Earth only, simply because that's the common usage. Okay, so here's an example of a projection. It's a projection in which the object reference model, we'll define that in a moment, that is the model that describes the shape, if you will, of the thing that we are trying to visualize here in this flat projection, is not the Earth and is not intended to be the Earth. Yet we can use similar mechanisms to the way we describe the shape of the Earth to describe the shape of other planetary bodies. Next slide. And for those who didn't figure it out on that one, this one may be a little bit more helpful because it is a projection that tends to give you the sense that there's something round out there as opposed to something which is flat. Next slide. As I've already described, there are a variety of spatial information that are not necessarily bound to near or on the surface of the Earth. Uh, there's information we need to be able to describe that goes all the way out to the corona of the sun. And here's an example of various uh, particle densities, magnetic field interactions, and even our good friend in northern or southern lights. Next slide. What I'm going to do is I'd like to go through some basic nomenclature. Some of this will seem completely obvious to you, and that's great. But pay attention, because in some cases, we may have bound a slightly different definition than the one you're familiar with. Why is that? Well, the problem is, is we're trying to cover a very large domain and a very large collection of potential customers for the technology. Many of those customers come to the problem from different perspectives. Uh, there are a large set of folks that come from mapping, charting, geodesy, uh, and imagery, uh, data producers, if you will, and they have a perspective on what the scope of the problem is. But we also have an interesting collection of customers, say the command and control community, or the modeling and simulation community, or maybe in the ground transportation community, or maybe in the facilities management community, or maybe in the computer-aided design communities, and they all have their own nomenclature, and they don't necessarily agree with each other. So one of the first steps we had to take was to try to define a consistent set of nomenclature that we could build up to capture the right concepts so that then around those concepts we could build up the necessary mechanism to solve the problems that Ralph has alluded to. So standard definition of coordinates, I think everybody's comfortable with that, but you'll notice that that definition depends upon other definitions. There's this idea of the ability to position something with respect to a reference frame. So what's a reference frame? And by the way, before I answer that question, I want to point out that there's, of course, a relationship between some of the terms and context that we'll describe here in the spatial reference model and how that information is captured and represented as part of the center's data representation model. So we digress for a moment and point out where a coordinate ends up. In fact, it ends up in objects, data representation objects, that are known as locations. Next slide. In fact, if you go take a look at the UML notation for the data representation model in CEDRUS, you will see an abstract class called location, which has two sub-abstract classes called location 2D and 3D, and then a large number of classes underneath them that represent locations, but with respect to particular reference frames. In fact, there are actually 151 reference frames currently in the SRM, so some of these objects, in fact, represent families of reference frames that vary by parameters that would be uh, captured as part of the field data currently hidden with respect to this diagram of these objects. Next slide. Okay, what's a spatial reference frame? A spatial reference frame serves to locate coordinates in a multidimensional space. And we're very interested in two and three dimensional spaces. One dimensional spaces are interesting mathematically speaking, but in fact not very practical in what we'll call it in the real world. But two and three dimensions are very important to us 
We specify spatial reference frames in two components, and this is a key idea. The first component is a geometric description or model of a reference object. Why is that? Well, we're not just dealing with math here, we're dealing with the real world. We have to tie our coordinate system, which is the second piece, to something. In an earlier slide, we tied it to that something that represented the combination of that sensor, boom, and shuttle arrangement. That provided a reference model, an object reference model, to which we could tie a coordinate system. We could potentially tie many different coordinate systems to that reference model. So, the first component here we call the object reference model, which provides us that context, that place that we're going to tie to, and very important in our community is an Earth reference model. But as I've already described, there are other reference models that are important as well, depending on the context in which the environmental information was captured or transmitted. The second spatial reference frame is the composition of, or the selection of, a specific object reference model and a coordinate system. Together they form a spatial reference frame. So, point at the bottom of the slide. That's why we say we have no naked coordinate systems. A naked coordinate system is X, Y, Z. There, I've got a right-handed coordinate. What, what, what good is this? How does this tell me where something is? This can tell me where something is with respect to somewhere here in my palm, but that doesn't do me very much good in tying that information to any particular environment that you may be interested in. So it is not valid to talk about a coordinate system in and of itself. You have to tie it to some object, and we'll tie that by binding it to an object reference model in the context of spatial reference frame. Next slide. An example. In fact, an example that harkens back to the point that was made earlier about the frame which was used in the DIS standard. One common spatial reference frame is a combination of an Earth reference model. Okay, these are the ones we're most familiar with, and we'll talk about various Earth reference models that are in use in our community. In general, we tend to think in terms of an ellipsoid revolution with a set of parameters associated with it. And a right-handed Cartesian coordinate system, which will place in a specific relationship to the center or origin of that Earth reference model, tie it with respect to a rotational plane, we often think of the equator as providing that binding to a rotational plane, and the axis of the ERF. And in particular here, here's an example. i have taken a right-handed Cartesian system, I've bound it to the center of an ERM and its rotational plane and a prime meridian. And then I can talk about a point P and its relationship to that center, which is now bound through the ERM to this larger object. In particular, this is the geocentric coordinate system and is used in DIS. The Earth reference model is based on the WGS84 ellipsoid and its associated mass center. So I can then talk about XYZ location to some point as reference to that center. This would be called an Earth-centered, Earth-fixed system because the x-axis is bound to the prime meridian and the x and y axes fall in the rotational plane. The z-axis goes, it falls in the rotational axis. Next slide. In Cedrus, we have a variety of spatial reference frames. And we're going to go progressive details we head to the right on this slide. But the lowest level of detail, we've broken our spatial reference frames into these groups. I've already introduced the idea of a reference model, of an object reference model, which is somewhat arbitrary in the sense that it's not bound to the Earth or perhaps bound to a large planetary body. And you see some examples at the moment, but you're sitting in one. Somebody at some point, architectural firm probably, drew a model of this facility. They didn't really care where it was in the world. All they needed was a right-handed Cartesian system from some origin so they could talk about how many meters wide the room was, how long it was, and where the room started with respect to that origin. And they weren't particularly concerned about the lat long for the origin, maybe a little bit concerned with the orientation, but that was about it. And we'll talk about that in a moment when we call those local space rectangular. We haven't really defined enough information to bind that origin, but once we're in that frame, we can talk about directions, distances, uh, etc. But if we move down, we'll be talking about systems in which the reference model is an Earth reference model. In this case, we've already mentioned Earth-centered, Earth-fixed. Uh, we have a set of systems that are Earth surface and global. In fact, there's really only one. It's the one we know familiar is long-based or geodetic. There are those that are Earth surface and local, sometimes called topocentric, where we take a right-handed system, but we bind it to some place on the Earth surface. Actually, we bind it to some place on the Earth reference model. And you'll hear this report repeated several times. A lot of what we're doing here is we're talking about mathematical descriptions and models 
that allow us to position things. And it requires additional information to actually talk about the shape of the Earth itself, the real space, the place that you're sitting right now. There are a collection of projection-based systems that stem from our experience in the community going back hundreds of years, back to Mr. Mercator and certainly well beyond him, uh, that relate to the need or the desire to take a curved shape and flatten it so that we can put on a sheet of paper, carry it around, and there are distortions involved in that. We refer to this as projection-based systems, and there are a whole collection of those, and we'll see those in a moment. Finally, as I've already described, there's lots of environmental data that does not tie to the Earth's surface. In particular, there are a set of coordinate systems that may be Earth-centered, but they are inertial or quasi-inertial. They don't rotate with the Earth. Uh, some of them are oriented toward the sun. Some of them are oriented toward a fixed space or relatively fixed space somewhere out elsewhere in our galaxy, for example. We refer to these generally as a class as inertial and quasi-inertial. Next. There's our local space rectangular and geode geocentric and geodetic. We have two general categories of these Earth surface locals, local tangent plane, and then GCS, which is a collection, a well-defined collection of about 49,000 local tangent planes that cover the surface of the Earth. We're going to be talking about these projections. There are lots more projections. There are more projections over there than you'll find listed here. These, however, are the projections that are in fairly common use in our community among folks that produce data, provide data, consume data, or want to be able to represent the location of perhaps their virtual assets um, and, and deal with uh, the relationships among locations. So we'll be talking about Mercator, a black Mercator, transverse Mercator, a variation on universe, uh, transverse Mercator called universal transverse Mercator, and there are actually 60 of those in order to cover the surface of the Earth. Uh, Lambda <laughs> conformal conic, polar stereographic, uh, a variation on polar stereographic known as universal polar stereographic, of which there are two, one for each pole. And then an interesting non-conformal projection called equidistant cylindrical, which has received a lot of use in the graphics or virtual simulation community. Finally, there are five inertial and quasi-inertial systems that we are, will be addressing briefly later on. Next slide. Ralph has already introduced the idea that we need to be able to talk about two and three dimensions. And in particular, we'll be using the term, and you'll hear Ralph talking a lot about the term, augmentation. Projections, <laughs> those things over there and all these things over here, are only two-dimensional phenomena. They only develop a relationship between points on the surface of the ellipsoidal representation of the Earth and points on a piece of paper on a two-dimensional plane. They do not have a third dimension. You may choose to mark a z-value on there or draw a contour line, and in fact, the projection does not preserve that. We've added that off time. So we talk about two-dimensional projections, and then a third dimension we've augmented by planting a z-vector in some fashion on it. But other than those, these other systems can be thought about in terms of two and three dimensions. We traditionally think of geodetic as a two-dimensional system, but in fact, off times are really thinking three-dimensional. But what's on your map is two-dimensional. Uh, geocentric is inherently three-dimensional, but even those folks that do CAD sometimes only want to think about the plan view of this facility, so they only think in terms of an X and Y and not a Z. And one can do the same thing in terms of a local tangent plane representation. Next and final. We're going to be talking in the next couple of slides about Earth <coughs> reference models. And in fact, folks out there usually use ellipsoids of revolution, but there are some folks with very good reasons that use spherical approximations. And in not all cases, insofar as implementing this standard, do we necessarily support the ellipsoidal uh, ERMs? And in this particular case, there are two here. We're only supporting the spherical use. Next slide. <coughs> Some little pictures. We're going to walk quickly down the side. Two-dimensional plane, X and Y. Three dimensions, we've added Z on that. Geocentric, you've already seen X, Y, Z centered at the, say, mass center. Over on the left-hand side now here, we have these pictures are actually backward. This is a three-dimensional view of a geodetic. And you'll notice here, and we'll repeat again, that the latitude, these are not all Earth-centered angle. Latitude is not an Earth-central angle. Next. And of course, we can talk about the two-dimensional version of that where we do not worry about the Z. That is, we're always on the surface of whatever the ERM. Over on the right, we have some topocentric systems. We have a two-dimensional based upon the local tangent plane. A three-dimensional, we've added a Z on that. A collection, and there's just two small segments of the 49,000 that might be out there. Then we have a collection of projections. We'll go into each of these projections in a little more detail. A Mercator, a Blight Mercator, which doesn't show up very well here. Transverse Mercator, uh, Lambert Conformal, a Polar Stereographic, Equidistant Cylindrical, 
and then a collection of five um, inertial or quasi inertials in which all cases the angle here is actually these are all earth central angles next Let's skip all the way through those five next slide okay I think the definitions on this slide are clear and well understood and we have not in any way changed I think the definitions that are understood amongst our various communities next slide okay earth reference models what am I talking about when I use that phrase an Earth reference model is a specification of the mathematical shape of the Earth. The Earth is a mathematical model of the shape of the Earth. It's usually in terms of a combination of either ellipsoid of revolution <coughs> or sometimes in terms of an equipotential surface, which is called a geoid. This is equi gravitational potential. That is the geoid. And excludes the topographic surface, the thing you walk on, if you will. Both of these that is the ellipsoid of revolution and the geoid are really mathematical approximations, successively better, but they are not the actual shape of what you walk on outside. When you add the dirt, okay, when you add the dirt, you end up with the dirt being below sometimes and above sometimes either of those two mathematical models. Now it happens, and there is a complex explanation we will not go into today, that we often consider the geoidal surface to be approximated by mean sea level. Mean sea level is something you can go out and measure over a period of time at many locations around the boundaries of the major land masses. If you were to create a surface of collecting all, connecting all those zeros together, you would get a continuous shape that nominally represents mean sea level over the surface of the Earth. Uh, clearly, you can't do that in the middle of these large uh, bodies of uh, dirt, but you could imagine cutting canals through them and letting things equilibrate. Now that's a little different than the fact that we do today. That's the bad old days. In the new old days, we have all these interesting constellation satellites up there, which are making gravimetric measurements, um, and which can be brought together. And in fact, WGS84 provides for us, uh, back in 1984, a model of the geoid, which is a mathematical description, very complex, which comes close to, but is more exact than mean sea level. In fact, that model is out of date. Okay, we now have an Earth gravity model. A little more recent than that, 1996, which in fact is even a better approximation to the Earth's geoid. On the right hand side, we simply provide a definition of the topographic surface. Let's take a look at the lines here. This dotted line is the ellipsoid. It is very easy to describe mathematically. And in fact, it is so easy to describe mathematically, that is the surface we talk about when we talk about developing a map projection. Now you'll notice that that surface is an approximation to, but is not the same as this surface here. This black line, which we've called the geoid and noted as approximately MSL, I can go outside and measure. I can go down to my local shore and measure a zero over some period of time. Um, I can use other equipment to measure a local gravitational potential. So I can physically measure that in the real world. Then if I add the dirt, in some places I'm going to be above, in some cases I'm going to be below, and note that there is a separation between these two. Just to give you a feel for the difference between the geoid and the ellipsoid, this separation, although not large, does grow as high as 80 to 100 meters, depending on where you're on the Earth's surface, both positive and negative. In the bad old days, it probably wasn't all that important, but in the good old days where we have precise positioning, 80 <coughs> meters is a big deal. And in fact, just to give you an example, in the DARPA Stowe program, the first time we built a database uh, in the uh, Southwest Asia, we didn't get our separation value right, and uh, Kuwait City became very much waterlogged. So you need to care, care, careful attention to that. So in the spatial reference model, there is no Earth. There are models of the Earth. But where does the Earth come from? Well, when I generate a center's transmittal, I off time am going to put in elevation values, whether it's a grid or the information associated with the collection of polygons. At that stage, I take my geoid or ellipsoid as defined by my spatial reference model, and I add the interpretation for that elevation or height. And the result of that interpretation ends up being these red points that define a topographic surface. But the SRM does not do that for you. You actually generate data from the real world. So if you go to NEMA and you ask for a DTED product, you will get a collection of Z values that tell you about the relationship between these red points and the geoid or mean sea level. Next slide. Here are the standard ellipsoids that we are supporting in the SRM. There are 23, I believe, at this point. Uh, they are well understood. In fact, they come from, and these parameter values come from, a NEMA standard publication, which we'll reference in a little bit. Next slide. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are folks in our community that do not use ellipsoid revolution as their reference model. They use spheres. 
Now, I think that's dumb as dirt. But then, they're not doing dirt. They're doing atmospheric modeling. If you're doing atmospheric modeling, you're going to make approximations. You need to make approximations. We don't have enough compute power. In fact, in particular, when doing atmospheric modeling, you're trying to deal with large systems of differential equations. And the kilometer or so difference between an approximation of the shape of the Earth based on a sphere and the one that's based on ellipsoid revolution falls well within the error margin of the other approximations that are going on in that model. So when you get atmospheric data, you're probably getting that data in terms of a spherical model of the Earth, not an ellipsoid revolution model of the Earth. So in fact, some of these names here actually tie to existing atmospheric models as used in the BOD community. Uh, coupled ocean atmosphere, mesoscale prediction system, uh, etc. Well, notice one here in the middle. These aren't atmosphere guys. These are our good friend, the image generation visualization guys who just decided the Earth was a sphere as far as they were concerned because they weren't going to look too far. So the anomalies associated with that was not a problem. Next slide. Okay. <coughs> Now, so far, when I've described an ERM, I've just given you a mathematical shape. The Earth is lumpy. One aspect of that lumpiness is the fact that you have a geoid, which differs from the ellipsoid. The mass changes over position. So a surface of constant gravitational potential is not as smooth as an ellipsoid revolution. I need to bind that ellipsoid revolution to the Earth and over many years and in many places, various ellipsoids have been chosen, and they've been bound to the surface of the Earth for purposes of a good local approximation. But up until the last 30 years, there was really no sound basis for developing an ellipsoid and a binding that was a good global approximation. So there are a large number of bindings between specific ellipsoids and specific places on the Earth's surface. That binding we'll call horizontal datum. In fact, you'll see here, we have some names. In fact, there's a lot that aren't here. There are 250 or more in common usage. There's a binding of a specification of ellipsoid and some information, which we won't worry about at this point, which basically relates the origin of that ellipsoid to the origin of a standard ellipsoid. In our community, we adopt the standard ellipsoid, which has been associated with WGS84. And in fact, you can see we have empty here, because it's 0, 0, 0, if you will. Over here is very interesting. These bindings are only valid over some regional area. We have bindings that are good for the continental United States. We have bindings that are really only good for portions of the continental United States. We have bindings that are appropriate to particular ellipsoids for different places in the world. And that's the reason why we have so many horizontal datums. Now, in the brave new world we're in, we're just going to do everything in terms of one global binding. Life is great. But there's a problem. It's the problem I call the Willie Sutton rule. Willie Sutton, famous bank robber, asked, why do you rob banks? So that's where the money is. Almost all the data that you're going to come into contact today was generated or collected in terms of previously existing data. We went the Desert Storm, Desert Shield. We had fratricide problems because we had multiple maps with multiple horizontal datums, which were there for very good reasons. But we pass along coordinates, and we didn't pass along the datum associated with the coordinates. So those folks were talking about locations, but they were the locations with respect to different Earth reference models. You have to know your reference frame, not just your location. Otherwise, that location is meaningless or in error. Last decade, NEMA had to reproduce every map sheet over Korea because the local datum is about a kilometer different in location than a global datum, WGS84. And users were getting confused. Which location? Which, which data am I talking about? So we solved the problem by reproducing all the paper so the users don't get confused anymore. They all are using now the same data. Of course, hopefully they don't talk to any of the Korean local maps or we're going to get in trouble with it. Next slide. Now, so far, I've talked about the ERM as a means for locating things near the surface of the Earth. Like we've talked about the shape of the ellipsoid, the shape of the geoid, and then the ability to talk about Z with respect to that. Z with respect to that. Well, which of those surfaces do I want to use? I've already defined the fact that for purposes of projections, and as you'll hear later, the geodetic coordinates, we use the ellipsoid. Because the math is easy, well, relatively easy. It's certainly easier than using the geoid. However, when we want to put z values out there, we measure them. And we measure them with respect to something that's physically present, not a mathematical model. We measure it with respect to mean sea level, traditionally. So we need to define a vertical datum. 
What's my reference surface to capture the z-value? In fact, there are multiple vertical datums out there. The traditional one, of course, is mean sea level. But in fact, we have vertical datums that have been defined for various purposes over local or non-global areas of the world. And even though we have the WGS-74 ellipsoid and geoid, we also have, for instance, two datums which have been used over various periods of times to capture z-values or elevations in CONUS. We have an international standard in this area. I've mentioned the Earth Gravity Model 96, which for some purposes can be treated the same as the WGS-84 geoid. But for precise positioning and z-value purposes, you may not want to do that. Like an interesting discussion earlier this year was the space shuttle. We're collecting all this data. What do you think the vertical data ought to be? Think about it. Are we collecting that data with respect to mean sea level? Does anybody go down with the yardstick and measure, you know, to sea level? They do not. They're collecting the data with respect to what amounts to an orbital model. That orbital model is defined in terms of the geoid. It's defined in terms of gravity. And in fact, what you'll find when you get those new systems of data, you look at your detail, you will find the vertical data will no longer say WGS84. It'll say EGM96, because that, in fact, is the reference frame for that vertical measure of which that data was collected. Now, you may choose to treat the two as the same, and that's OK. But you are bringing in an error or an assumption to do that. Next slide. OK. Kind of got this message across already. Earth is an important object reference model, but there are others. The example is spacecraft body centric. And I also introduced the concept of an LSR. An LSR is an object reference model. It's kind of primitive because I really don't place the origin with respect to some larger body. But I do define the idea of up and forward so that at least I could orient my building. I'd be kind of uncomfortable if my architects came along and thought that positive elevation went that way, for example. I really want to talk about which way to orient my two primary axes, because the third then the former right hand system is also oriented as well. So in general, we'll talk about spatial reference frames being the composition of an object reference model plus a coordinate system. But we will often, and I'll make this mistake as well commonly, we'll really be talking about an Earth reference model, even though there are other objects that potentially could provide the reference model. Next slide. There are many, 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 many spatial reference frames. Just think about the cross product of all some of the variations I just showed you in terms of the parameters by which one could define an Earth reference model. And you've already seen many examples of different coordinate systems that could be used with respect to an Earth reference model. We break that into two views. One is we could talk about using a common Cartesian coordinate system with the same relationship to an ERM, perhaps embedded in the center or on the surface, but with differing ERMs, perhaps defined by different ellipsoidal models. Any examples of that? Conversely, I could use the same ERM, for instance, WGS84 ellipsoid, but define many different coordinate systems based on it, two being, for example, geocentric or local tangent plane. And we have a problem. Everyone's unique. Everyone's unambiguous. Everyone can be exactly related to the other at some cost. And as much as we would like, and I'll tell you five years ago, we came into this business and said, oh, we're going to get one or two or three solutions, and everybody's going to live with them. And it just doesn't work that way. Because in fact, almost every one of those has a strong customer base who's made a very good engineering decision to use that one. We're migrating the community in the direction of some standards. For instance, we'd like to migrate everybody in the direction of a standard Earth reference model, perhaps the WGS84 ellipsoid and geoid pair, the WGS84 ellipsoid and the Earth Gravity Model 96 pair. We've got a long way to go, and we have a very large legacy of collected data, which was not collected in terms of that Earth reference model. Next slide. So we've cut a bunch of pieces. So what's the spatial reference model that we want to talk about? The spatial reference model provides a well-defined set of spatial reference frames, object reference models, and coordinate systems. Remember, these are used to compose spatial reference frames, and allows coordinates to be specified succinctly and converted accurately between different spatial reference frames. It actually needs to do a little bit more than that, as we've already alluded to. It's more than just being able to map the coordinates from one frame to another. We want to talk about relationships between them. We want to be able to talk about vectors or angles, both elevation and azimuth angles, distances, and things of that form. Plus, we need to understand there's always a trade-off between accuracy and performance. And trade-off that is good for you may be bad for me and vice versa. Next slide. 
There are some terms that are used in the community, particularly the mapping, charting, and geodesy community, which is based on conversion and transformation. You need to understand them because you will hear them used. And in particular, instead of coordinate transformation, they'll often talk about a datum transformation. What do they mean when they say that? Well, coordinate conversion is the process of determining the equivalent spatial location of a point in SRF, which is based on the same object reference model, but a different coordinate system. So we've all agreed that our Earth reference model is based on WGS84, but I use transverse Mercator and you use geodetic. So I do a coordinate conversion when I try to take the location reference from the transverse Mercator and define that location now or describe it in terms of the parameters which would locate it in the same place, the equivalent location, but now with respect to this other reference frame, which is based on geodetic. <coughs> and coordinate transformation is just the reverse. You've already got a clue because I said some folks will call this datum transformation. You're talking about the same coordinate system, but you've changed your Earth reference model. In particular, we'll talk about datum shifting. Converting coordinates between two arbitrary SRFs may require a combination of both a coordinate conversion and a coordinate transformation. That is, you have to account for the differences in the coordinate systems and the differences in the Earth reference or the object reference models. There are other types of operations than just the ones I've described for coordinates. And we're going to spend some time later on talking about problems associated with directional measures such as azimuth and elevation angle and the types of distortions you get into which are very difficult to resolve when you try to move back and forth between these different spatial reference frames. Next slide. There are errors associated with trying to do that move. There are errors potentially which are in formulation. There are errors associated with implementation. And there are errors associated with usage. Ralph's going to be talking a little later this morning about formulation implementation issues or errors. And I'll be talking late in the morning on usage errors, of which this activity today is trying to address at least a portion of that. You need to understand that when it comes time to interoperate with someone else or someone else's data, which was defined or located with respect to a different spatial reference frame than the one you are using, it is a non-trivial operation to move that data across. And moving that data across will, in at least some circumstances, and in the case of the MNS community, a lot of circumstances, there will be distortions involved. If you don't understand the nature of distortions, and you make assumptions about that conversion being distortionless, lossless, if you will, you get into interesting problems. Some of them subtle and some of them not so subtle. Next slide. Okay. Four slides just to make sure you understand some of the basic terminology that we'll be doing. Next. This was our model. Here's an ellipsoid. There's a binding XYZ at the center. And this gives you a basic description of the geodetic framework. You'll notice we have a longitude, okay, as an Earth central angle. We have a latitude. This is not an Earth central angle. The latitude is the angle between the local tangent plane and the vector. And remember, since this is ellipsoid, local tangent plane will not be perpendicular to a radius. It'll tend to be the ellipsoid is flattened here, and if you will, a little more bulgy on the equator. If you were to take a slice through this and treat this as a two-dimensional system, you'd see this sort of relationship. Notice that this vector is perpendicular to what would be the local tangent plane. Next slide. In the case of a spherical ERM, you would be talking an Earth central angle here because, in fact, we are on a sphere. The local tangent plane is, by definition, also always perpendicular to a radius. In that case, we'd be talking about, instead of a geodetic latitude, we'd be talking about a geocentric latitude. There's also another latitude we'll go into called astronomic latitude. Another one we'll go into called geomagnetic latitude. Next. You've seen a version of this. I want to repeat this because I want to point out this concept called geoidal separation, number one. And number two, what might we mean when we talk about height or elevation? Uh, in this picture, Red is my ellipsoid. This is the mathematical surface. I can define this exactly. Blue, or light blue here, baby blue, is my geoid. And you'll notice there's a separation between the two. And then I've drawn a line here, which is the Earth's physical surface. Now, when I get a value and call it height, what does that mean? Well, this could be the height as measured from or calculated between the physical surface, here's my point of measurement, and the geoid. And that's typically what you get when you get a data set because the geoid is something I can go out and measure. So here's a height that's called h. What is that precisely? h is called the orthometric height. That is, I've defined a value and the reference surface to which that value has been measured. 
And you'll notice the value is measured based on a local perpendicular to that surface. Okay. There's another height drawn here from that same point, but now to the ellipsoid. There's little h. That's called the geodetic height. You'll notice that the height is measured perpendicular to the ellipsoid. Guess what? The geoid and the ellipsoid are not parallel to each other, and therefore those perpendiculars are not the same vector. Now, given as I've defined that this geodal separation is less than 100 meters, as long as you're reasonably close to the surface of the Earth, the fact that these vectors are slightly different from each other can be factored out and ignored, and that we commonly do. But if you were to go a long way from that surface as defined by the ellipsoid of the geoid, in fact, the separation is really a vector quantity, not a scalar quantity. But we will introduce the simplifying assumption that we can treat it as a scalar quantity. Next slide. Many folks are concerned not just about where they are, but a very important vector to them is gravity. And it's important to remember that although this blue surface is a surface of constant gravity potential, and by definition on that surface the gravity vector is always normal and down with respect to it, the gravity potential varies in space not only in a scalar fashion but a vector fashion. Again, near the surface of the Earth it's in the problem. As you move away from the surface of the Earth, if you're going to get into orbital dynamics, this is a major issue. You need to be concerned about it. Next slide. Okay, here's a graphic. I showed you in a tabular form all of the SRMs that are being covered by the SRM. But here's one that perhaps is a little more intuitive and help you cement a couple of relationships. Here's our geodetic representation. I've intentionally over flattened it. Change tape. Relationship to geocentric or earth centered, earth fixed. So this is, if you will, a right handed system embedded in the ellipsoidal or geoidal model. I can relate this earth centered, earth fixed right handed system to those that are placed on the surface of the geoid, a local tangent plane or collection of them. I can tie all my inertial and quasi inertial systems again to this geocentric approximation. And on the left hand side, left of this line, I can refer to these all as earth referenced. 3D or 2D SRFs. So the right of the line, I have the projection-based systems. They all start from a description of the shape of this curve. In fact, they all start with an ellipsoid of revolution description of the shape of this surface. And each introduces a mapping function that is defined by this name and a collection of parameters to flatten that surface out or section that surface out. And then oftentimes we augment it by sticking a z-value. And you've seen all these before, and as I pointed out previously, the universals are variations with specific parameters of the associated non-universals. You'll notice I've intentionally pointed out here that I have local space rectangular 3 and 2D, and they're, they're out in the clouds. Because by their definition, they don't have sufficient information to tie them to the real world. I know what up and forward means, but I don't know where that origin gets placed with respect to some place in the real world. Now, it doesn't mean I can't use them. But it means that if I intend to, say, take this CAD-style model of this building and actually mount it in, tie it to instances at this location, perhaps in a topographic representation of the valley we're in, I need additional information. And there are places in the center of transmittal or the data representation model where that additional information is required and then is used in order to cite this model within the context of this local representation of your surface. Next slide. Okay, map projections. I'm going to walk very quickly through these because a lot of this is just pretty pictures. There are a couple of messages here you need to understand because we'll be assuming you understand them when we go into the next section. So as pointed out on the previous slide, map projections were invented a long time ago for the purposes of creating a flat representation of information about the surface of the Earth. Okay. We can talk about the concept mathematically of developable, non-developable surfaces. The cone and the cylinder can be sliced and rolled out. That is, the surface of the cone or cylinder, in fact, can be mapped to a plane with no distortions involved. A sphere or an ellipsoid is a non-developable surface. Although I can slice it up into a whole bunch of orange peels, if you will, I have to make them infinitely thin if I want to get rid of distortions. And infinitely thin peels are not particularly helpful. Um, and of course, we're all familiar with that model. This is what happens when you try to make that thing work. So you should have the intuition that fundamentally distortions happen, and the issue is how do we manage those distortions? Next slide. So what's a map projection? Conversationally, we can call it an association between the points on the surface of an ERM with points on an XY plane, or more formally, here's a description. So I want to take points on the surface of this ERM, 
and I want to map a point from here onto a point from here, another point and another point, etc. But since the spheres and ellipsoids are not developable, you get distortions. Notice also that the whole concept of projection is based on a 2D model, and there is no Z here. There's no vertical axis associated with this projection. Next. If we kind of slice and think about this from a one-dimensional perspective to understand that relationship. Here I've sliced through an ERM, and I just have nominally a circle here. Uh, I've identified some points here that are intended to be equally spaced along that surface, the circle. I've drawn a flat surface. Here's my one-dimensional line. And I'm going to develop a mapping, a projection, from each point here on the surface of the circle, which are equidistant from each other, onto this one-dimensional surface. So the projection relates this point to this point, etc. Number one, you will notice, potentially stylized, that points that are equally spaced on this surface are not equally spaced here. Secondly, you'll notice that these red points, which have a non-zero Z value, if you will, they are not on this surface, do not map at all. They are meaningless with respect to the projection. Okay, next slide. A couple quick projections, just in case you haven't seen these pictures before. Um, important point that you'll see in a number of these pictures. Basically, what you can think of from a geometric perspective when you're developing a projection is you are taking perhaps a solid here representing the surface of the Earth. In this case, we'll assume it's an ellipsoid. And we're going to take a geometric model, perhaps a cylinder, and we're going to kind of relate them to each other. In this case, what we've done is we've taken a cylinder, we've aligned it with the north-south polar axis, and we've adjusted the radius of the cylinder so it is the radius of the Earth reference model at the equator. In other words, the cylinder becomes tangent at the equator to the Earth reference model. Obviously, it's not tangent anyplace else. Now, we can also take that cylinder and squeeze a little bit. We can have the radius of the cylinder smaller than the radius at the equator. When we do that, we refer to that cylinder as being secant. If you think about it for a moment, what you have now is instead of a single line where the points on the surface are the same as the points on the cylinder, I actually have two lines these would be parallels where the points on the cylinder and the points on the surface are exactly the same. When I'm between the parallels, the surface here is outside the cylinder, and then when I'm outside of the parallels, the surface becomes inside the cylinder. Next slide. I can do the same thing with a plane. I can define a plane as being tangent to a surface or embedded in that ERM, so it's secant. I can move that plane up to a pole. Here's a stereographic projection. Here's a traditional view of a look down at the North Pole. These are normally defined tangent, but in fact, they may also be defined secant, and we'll see an example of that in a bit. We can take a cone, and we can either have a tangent to the surface or embedded. The traditional model of the United States, where you see you know, those funny states up in the Northwest that have this kind of curve on the top, you are seeing a Lambert conformal conic projection, which is based on secant. There are two parallels where they are one to one, and you have a distortion that is a change in the scale factor here, and a different change when you go outside of those parallels. Here, in fact, you see your traditional embedding of the U.S., uh, continental U.S. within a member control projection. Next. Mercator is based on a cylinder, and uh, we've already introduced Jerry Mercator over here, the bearded fellow. And basically, his goal was to provide a mechanism for a worldwide map, and this, of course, would be if we pretended that Latin long were equal. Okay, this is not a Mercator projection, this is. You'll notice here that while lines of latitude are equally spaced, lines of, lines of longitude are equally spaced, lines of latitude are not. And in fact, in particular, the pole is smeared out to infinity. And in fact, the North Pole gets smeared all the way across the top of this projection. The South Pole is smeared all the way across the bottom of the projection. So the distortion is zero at the equator and progressively worse as I head toward the polar. Next. I can take that cylinder and I can rotate it called the oblique mercator. Now, of course, my line of tangency, or my pair of lines of sequency, are not, do not follow a line of latitude, as they did before. Do not follow a line of longitude, either. They follow this oblique. And I can define a number of obliques. And you can see here, when you look at this representation, that, in fact, my lines of latitude and longitude become very interesting curves. Now, I can go further. And I can take this and rotate this. And in fact, we do have another poster we didn't have time to put up. I don't know when Ralph wants to show that. We can show you what the transverse Mercator looks like. Next slide. And now what I've done is I'm wrapping this way around. So the point of wrap is defined as a central meridian right here, where I have no distortions. But as I move away from that meridian, I have increasing distortions. And you'll see this picture again when we talk about distortions. Next slide. 
I can go, however, and define a whole bunch of meridians of wrap, in fact, 60 of them, where I kind of slice the Earth's surface into six degree slices. And here's an example slice. I, might, I may, may choose to cut it uh, short of the North and South Pole. And in fact, it normally is cut. This particular one happens to be a subset that's been cut to only 42 to 42. Normally, will be cut 84 down to minus 80. And talk about each one of those as a separate zone, where I've managed my distortions, but I do have distortions I need to consider. Next slide. So Mercator's formulation, and really a prime driver for that formulation, was the ability to describe lines of constant heading. And if you take a look at what is preserved in this representation, you can see that I can define a line of constant heading throughout. But of course, in the real world, it wraps like this. and never quite reaches the North Pole. This line is known as a rum line or a loxodrum. And we'll come back to what a rum line is and how it relates to other measures of distance on the surface of the Earth. But if you look at this from a navigational perspective, this is traditionally the way one tends to look at it in terms of projections. Next slide. We've heard about great circles. In the Mercator projection, a great circle looks like this. It's not obvious why I'm not doing this. But the shortest distance on the surface of the ERM would be this line up here. And in fact, I can choose a different projection. And in fact, we've already showed you one, the oblique Mercator, where I've defined the line of interest to be the point of tangency, the edge of tangency between that cylindrical projection and the Earth's surface, such that I have zero distortion along this line, but increasing distortion as I move away from it. <coughs> this one, I had zero distortion here at the equator, but as I've moved, well, let's see, here at the equator, probably down the about, about here, but as I've moved away from the equator, I have increasing distortion. Next slide. Many map projections are conformal, and that table down the lower right, which was pointed out by Ralph, tells you which of them are and which are not. Most of our projections are conformal. The major one that is not is the equidistant cylindrical. Conformality means basically that angles are preserved, that the angle of ABC on this curved surface is the same angle of ABC when we map that to a plane. That's an important property. It's a property we're going to return to because we are concerned about angles, not just preservation of location, but preservation of angles. Otherwise, your azimuth becomes different when you go from one SRF to another. Next slide. Okay. Are there any questions on these two sections? We've introduced some basic terminology, and we've introduced the basic aspects of the different types of projections that we're going to be discussing in a moment. Now, what Ralph is going to do is start taking that basic information and addressing how the pieces fit together and what are the issues associated with fitting those pieces together. Great. No? We're going to talk about some of the distortions that get introduced by uh, using augmented map projections that you may not be familiar with. And these are used a lot, but a lot of people don't understand the distortions. Can I have the next uh, slide? It's clear that simulations usually require three dimensions, not always, but you'd like to have that. Some are three dimensions. Some of the SR, SR spatial reference frameworks are three dimensional by definition. Paul mentioned that. Map projections are always two dimensional, but they're often augmented with a vertical axis. And there's the opportunity with the little h or the big h to put different axes in two different nodes on on a uh, joint federation. It would be nice if they were the same, but People get confused. Various vertical measures are used by different people. Mean sea level, orthometric height, these are slightly <coughs> different. Uh, geodetic height, and there are people who put in pressure altitude and other kinds of measures of height. And this practice adds additional geometric distortion. I have the next slide. Uh, we've tried to, well, here, we're just showing that we have possibly two different <coughs> kinds of uh, but similar Earth reference models. So the ellipsoidal ones over here, they generate these various map projections, and each one of them can be augmented, and so we put an A in front of them. AUTM is augmented UTM. And then we have a community, mostly in a meteorological community, that do the same projections only off a of sphere, and then augment them, okay? Which is why we consider spheres. Now we have a problem that some of the coordinate relationships and either conversions or transformations 
preserve geometry and some don't. The kind of transformations involving projections distort the geometry, and there's a whole class of them that don't. So we've made a taxonomy for classifying these transformations. Mathematically, there's all kinds of words associated with transformations that might not have any meaning in this community, but they don't quite do the job for us. So what we did is we partitioned our uh, transformations and conversions into two classes. Very simply put, those that preserve geometry, length, angles, volume, shape, nothing gets distorted. And those that do distort, okay? And naturally one of them is green, one of them is red. I'll let you figure that out why. Operations among Earth reference 3D systems all over here preserve geometry. All of the projections, and this could be either a sphere <coughs> or an ellipsoid, distort geometry in one way or another, and the situation is worsened when you augment them, which we'll talk about in a minute. You need the next slide. There's all kinds of distortions that, that can occur. Usually, uh, our, our transformations are are conformal and so angles are preserved, but not distances. Straight lines become curved lines. Uh, shapes become different in the in the in the uh, image uh, after the transformation. So those are inherent in the projected itself, and then we come along and we stick those heights on there and add further distortions in the vertical direction. Can I have the next slide? I have some pictures that illustrate that. Now, this is the same picture Paul showed you before, where we've tried to equally space these points along this uh, circle, and they stretch this way, and that is a distance distortion. But now, the common practice for taking these red points, which don't map at all, and putting them on the plane, is to zip, simply take the height, in this case, the perpendicular height, from the surface of the circle, and stick them on there to form a three-dimensional system. When you do that, this angle, which you call elevation angle, is not the same angle as elevation over here. That's a severe distortion if you're trying to track something off of a UTM-based system, for instance. The point here is elevation angles are also distorted by the augmentation. Next slide, please. The reason we make a big point of that is you hear Gee, these are conformal, they preserve angles. Well, they only preserve angles in the plane, not in the vertical. This is a different kind of picture of, of the embedding that Paul talked about, of the, of the tangent plane being embedded in the surface of the uh, Earth reference model. If you use the dark line as your plane of projection, then the scale is one only at this point right here. If I move it up, the plane up and embed it a little bit, the scale at that point is less than one, and then gradually grows, and there's some point over here where it's equal to one, and then it's bigger than one. So we've kind of smeared the distortion out over the region. You can think about this in two dimensions. That's why you will see these embedded uh, planes all over the place. This picture is to show you in addition to uh, a, another discussion of the rum line problem, this is the same chart I think Paul showed before, but that the superimposed system, which is transverse Mercator in this case, really is the red stuff. It is truly a rectangular coordinate system. When you didn't have that red on there, you see all these curved lines, you're saying, how does that make a rectangular coordinate system? Well, there's really a rectangular coordinate system and what's curved are the parallels and the meridians represented in that coordinate system. So, positive x, positive y, negative. Traditional uh, rectangular coordinate system, if I augment it with a vertical, there's the vertical coming out of the board. Next slide. Now, we, you're going to see this chart several times. There's a term here called convergence of the meridian. How much distortion in azimuth do we have when we do one of these maps? Now, what is azimuth? It's something vaguely the angle to north. Okay? Well, where is north? 
In the projected system, north is perpendicular to the x-axis. It's called grid north sometimes. Where is north in the real system? Well, if you pick a point on a meridian, and the meridian's curved in this particular diagram, north is the direction that the tangent points at the point. And those directions are different. So if you're trying to plan a course in a projected system, you have to correct that angle to true north. That particular angle is called the convergence of the meridian. This formula is, ranges from very complex to very simple. In the Mercator case, we're able to stretch the, the pole out so much that the verticals all go north, and there is no correction. But that's not true in most cases. Now the next slide. Now th this is a very important chart, I think. This has to do with flattening of the ERM in terms of distance. If you have an augmented UTM coordinate system, for example, there's lots of distortions, and I, and I talked about some of them already. But one of them that might affect you in a combat model is this. One of the nodes in the joint simulation is a genetic coordinate, which is reference to the ellipsoidal ERM, and one of them is in UTM coordinates. In the, in the genetic system, here is a person standing here of that height, and another person standing here of that height, and there's an object in between such that line of sight is blocked. Can't see them. That's your curvature problem. When I map these points over into the plane of the projection, what maps? Well, based on our previous diagram, only the point on the surface maps, right? It goes there. Point on the surface goes there. Point on the surface goes there. What do we do about heights? We stick them on, right? And what happens is I can now see you. Now, people say, ah, oh, Earth curvature is a small effect. What's small here? Suppose you were in terrain that the Marines fight in, or infantry fighting in. How many times can you just not see over this little rock that's in front of you? Well, there's a lot of those. So small is a very relative thing. And we think that this is, has about a 20% effect, so that I can see you 20% more times than you can see me. It's really going to swing the battle from one side to the other. Can I have the next slide, please? We're going to talk a little bit how to select a, uh, how, how, how SRFs are selected in the modeling simulation business. And the next slide. Uh, there are lots of models and simulations in the world. People are modeling ground combat, ships, airplanes, orbital objects. There's all kinds of models. You have to move in the model space and know where you are, and therefore you need a sense of dynamics equation. Unfortunately, dynamics equations reference to something like a geodetic framework can get very complex. Complex here means not just hard to write down, but computationally complex because they have lots of trig functions on them. And so there's this desire on the, on the part of the model designer to use simplified versions of these equations. In Cartesian systems, generally, uh, these equations are simpler. Shortest distance between paths are straight lines, and you only need to do a square root to find that distance. If you're on the surface of a sphere, shortest distance between two points is an arc segment, and it's not just a square root, it's a bunch of spherical trigonometry to find that distance. In many coordinate systems, uh, and particularly in the case of the ellipse, ellipsoid, minimum distance paths are non-trivial to compute, can't even be done in closed form. Segments of ellipses lead to elliptic integrals, which you should know from your calculus. And if you start going away from the meridian cross country, you get something called a geodesic, which we have a picture of pretty soon. And then when you put on top of the Earth reference model to get the Earth, uh, an environment, 
Shortest distance meanings change completely. The shortest distance over the terrain now to another point may not be unique, and it's certainly not the same as the one that runs along the surface of the ERM, which you can't get to. There isn't anybody that walks on the ERM. Uh, next slide, please. Don't worry about the mathematics too much here, but I'm trying to explain why this complexity occurs. We start with F equals MA or Newton's second law of motion in some abstract inertial space fixed to the stars. We can let that system rotate. We do have rotating systems. We have to do that. And the resulting equations don't look too bad, partly because I wrote them in vector form and fooled you a little bit. When you write them in component form, they're a little messier. But as soon as you start embedding these or rederiving these in the context of an SRF involving an ellipsoid or a sphere, you're going to get some terms over here that are basically ugly. They're going to have sines and cosines and square roots and gravity components and all kinds of things in them that you won't like. So as a modeler, what I'm going to do maybe is throw them away and use a rectangular coordinate system and assume gravity points straight down to my plane. Now that's an approximation. It might be okay in some cases, but it's very distressing if you're doing that and somebody else is operating in a more complex system. The accumulated error will cause great problems in keeping the level playing field in force. Uh, next slide, please. Now this is the chart that ate New York City, but it tries to encapsulate what a, a decision-making process might consist of. Nobody does this, of course, well, except maybe a few dynamics guys. They usually start at the bottom and go in some direction. But you could theoretically start with this inertial framework, and you could consider rotating systems, fixed systems with respect to the stars, and almost fixed systems that are fixed with respect to the sun or some other place. And then within those potential coordinate systems that you could pick, you might want to pick rectangular or you might want to pick curvilinear. And I don't know if you can read that, but uh, rectangular is uh, geocentric or centered or fixed. Curvilinear would be geodetic or spherical coordinates. Now, the mapping, charting, and geodesy and imaging community came over this way. Their needs are different than other people's needs. They need to make maps, traditionally. And so they chose Earth reference models, which pretty much this day are all ellipsoidal. They don't even talk about spherical Earth models. That's very archaic. And from that, they generate all their various map projections to do their job. They don't augment, except to draw contours on the, the map. Okay. On this side of the, this chart, a, a person who's developing dynamics equations for models might choose to use kinematics or kinetics. They're different. Kinematics is what you learned in calculus. Distance equals velocity times time. Uh, acceleration is the second derivative. No forces involved. Kinetics, you start with F equals MA and derive the equations of motion. That's where you get all those complex differential equations. There's two approaches. Many times, modelers for combat modelers choose this branch. You come to a point, though, where you have to decide where up is, where are the gravity points. And it has to be artificially introduced from the outside. Over here, you don't have to do that, except that almost certainly, in order to increase performance, somebody will assume this little gravity component that points off to the side is zero. Anyway, what happened is that people who build models looked at all of this stuff and said, I don't want to do this complicated stuff. I want to do something simple. I'll run over here and grab map projections on which to base my kinematics equations or my kinetics equations. Oh, they don't have an altitude? I'll put one on. Okay. The differential equations you get over here don't have very much physical meaning because of all of the distortions we just talked about. Is that bad? Well, maybe. Depends on what you're doing. And we've listed some of the models down here that use different policies 
And some of these are in change, and some of them use mixtures of different systems, but it really aggravates our life when we try to talk to other models that are in different versions of these spaces. And the next slide. Let's skip the next few. Now I'm going to go into a, a discussion about geometry and trigonometry. The fact that distance measures have multiple means, I already said something about. I said there is some problem with what is an angular measure. You don't want to take a break? Okay. Uh, in our discussions, we forgot to mention that true north is always referenced to the north pole of the Earth reference model, which is a mathematical notion. The, the, the true north pole might be somewhere else, as we define it as part of the Earth, and the magnetic pole might be somewhere else. Now, the next slide, please. Now, you all know what a Euclidean distance is in a rectangular framework. It's just the sum of the squares of the components of these two points. You get a distance, and it happens to be an accident that the straight line equation between these two points, the distance between A and B, and the length of the line are the same. That's not true in all coordinate frameworks. And you can represent in parametric form the equation of the line. Very simple calculation, only a square root. ERMs are very useful for defining all the geometrical uh, concepts. Three-dimensional location, distance, angles, normals, elevation angles, and all the trigonometric relationships that go with them. very analogous to the surveying problem, which is a process used to estimate locations on the Earth. But how do they estimate those locations? They need a reference basis in order to put measurements on, and they use an Earth reference model. That's not the surface of the Earth, that's the Earth reference model. And on that model you can define distance, angle, elevations, and so on. But because you're not standing on the Earth reference model, you can't measure any of these things directly. You have to measure them indirectly. And then use mathematics of the model to get the right numbers out of it. And the next slide. Very complex process. I mentioned a little bit the instrumentation involved. Uh, there's a lot of geometry con uh, concepts uh, involving triangularization, traverses, and another meaning for chains which is a narrow string of triangles that people place together, called a chain. When you use devices to measure distance uh, in a surveying 
process, you have to correct for all kinds of environmental effects. Temperature, gravity, a whole bunch of things. The approaches you use depend on whether you're doing local, medium areas, or global surveys. This is why you get contention in the community. Some people say that's accurate enough, and other people say, no, it's not accurate enough. Well, it all depends on what you're doing. Now the next slide. Traditional distance determination in surveys. You've got a transit, and you can level it, and when you do that, you call it a theodolite, and a distance measuring device called a chain. In this case, it was a chain at one time, historically, and that process was also called chaining. But chains are too heavy and they sag too much. And people started using metal cables, metal rods. You've heard the term rod, which is, I don't know, 58 feet or something. That's the rod they use. And steel tapes that aren't really steel or inlar, you know, which is an alloy of steel that doesn't expand or contract too much. And what we actually measure are Euclidean distances, straight line segments. And we do that with the chain. And the theodolite is there to keep you on a particular ground line and to measure angles and elevation angles, azimuth and elevation. But you have to correct for a whole bunch of things. Catenary effect is that side due to gravity. And I like to tell my story that the initiation rights for being a survey crew member is Ralph, get out on the side of that hill, hold this pole up level, hold the chain and stretch it tight. Then you put the biggest guy and the crew on the other end of the chain, you were on the side of some hill where you're barely stable. So you got a good hold? Yeah, yank. <laughs> and you go rolling down the hill. They actually put a device on there with, that will measure the force on the chain. You're supposed to hold it to a certain stress, and then you know exactly what the catenary effect is. Oh, there's lots of thermal optical effects. This is all being replaced today with modern equipment. You've probably seen these van-like things that have a turret on the top that are parked along the road. And what there is inside there is a laser distance measuring device and a computer and something that measures the angles so they do all this processing inside that van. Although there's still people going out, but nobody uses chains. Well, I shouldn't say that because I don't know that, but distance measurement's done with laser rangefinders, basically. And I, I want to tell a war story about it. And you may think that this is very crude, what we were talking about. But in 1820-plus, the British, only the British would do this, <laughs> attempted a survey from the southern tip of India to the border of Tibet using, they used rods, 58 feet long rods to do the survey with. And they did things like build a trough of bamboo to hold a rod so it wouldn't sag. Well, every time you move 58 feet, you got another trough. Then they put a shade over the trough so that they didn't have the sun going on and off the trough so that you get different thermal temperatures. You had an ambient temperature. And they did a whole bunch of other stuff and they surveyed from the tip of the southern India clear up to the other end. And when he got there, somebody said, that's a big mountain over there. We think that's the highest one in the world. So the young lieutenant who was in charge of this, who was an artillery guy, he always put the artillery guys in charge of surveying, and said, well, here's my transit put up. Hmm, that mountain is so high. He missed by 138 feet, as determined by GPS recently. The guy uh, eventually got promoted, he got knighted, and uh, headed up the Royal Geographic Society. His name was George Evers, so they made the mountain after him. So amazing things could be done with relatively crude equipment. Back, suppose you were surveying a flat ERM with no terrain. Easy problem. I'm here, you're over here, I can measure distance, I can measure angles. All the points are on the surface of the ERM and I walk on it. Angles are easy to define because these normals to the plane are coplanar. And so I just swing to another point, which might be the North Pole or some reference point, and I can get an angle. And chaining is easy. Next slide. It's a little harder when you get on a, a spherical base or a reference model or when you add terrain. Suppose I add terrain to that flat guy. Now I can't walk on it, so what do I have to do? I have to walk on the terrain, 
In order to be able to see very far, I need to have a surveyor's pole. That's what that little thing is. And what do I measure? I measure straight lines using the chain. And how do I get the distance down here? I compute it using what? Trigonometry. That's the whole point of this. Doesn't affect the angle stuff either because I know what normal is and I can still swing my my uh, theodolite to, through an angle. You could add gravity to this, but it'd be a little bit messy. Then we go to spherical ERMs. Now, spheres have interesting properties. If I take a plane and cut it through the sphere, and such that the plane doesn't go through the origin, I get what's called the little circle. That's the intersection of the plane with the sphere on the surface. If I let the plane go through the center, to the origin, that's called the great circle. That's a red line. It turns out this line is shorter than that one. So the minimum distance path on a sphere is a great circle. <coughs> this can be computed using spherical trigonometry. You've probably all done it. One of the important points if you're operating on a sphere, though, and you take a normal at the point A and B, on a plane that goes through the, the center of the, um, of the model, those normals are always perpendicular to the surface, and they're always coplanar. So I don't have a problem in lining a transit up with somebody and swinging up to the North Pole where I have another guy standing. So I know exactly what azimuth is. But I have the next chart. Now we're going to put a train on top of the sphere. Same problem. I can't walk on it. I have to measure distances externally, and I have to do some kind of arithmetic, in this case, spherical trigonometry, to get the little arc lengths that are my reference distances that I'm going to put in my little book to tell me where I am. You could add gravity models by assuming gravity points towards the center. Now we're going to talk about the real problem. When you survey on a ellipsoidal ERM, you have all kinds of problems that you don't have in other cases. First place, minimum distance paths are not great circle arcs or geodesics, which are non-trivial to compute. This is the worst thing about them. Surface normals on a ellipsoidal ERM are generally not coplanar. Think of a football. Think about a normal sitting over here and a normal over here. You try to get them to lie on a plane and they don't. Worse than that, the normals don't even go through the center of the Earth. So now, if I put a transit down here and I swing it to a point, do I use the point on the surface of the ERM as a reference, or do I use the point up in the air? Which one of those is the angle? Well, that's what we're going to plow through here. Greatly complicates the definition of a bearing angle, and leads you to ellipsoidal trigonometry, which is a little more complex than the usual trigonometry. Here's the situation. We have the same two points, A and B. This red plane is, well, this hatch plane that sits here is the local tangent plane. You can take the derivatives and find the tangent plane. You can take a normal to that, and you can swing that normal about some vertical any way you want, using, say, your theodolite. And the question is, what's the bearing angle? Well, the bearing angle is where that plane is swung so it fits so it intersects the opposite point on the surface. That defines bearing angle. And it leads to a definition of azimuth from north. So, not up here, down here. Well, all of this is on the surface of the Earth reference model that we can't get to. So how are we going to get numbers for those things when we do survey? Let's go on to the next slide, which we talked a little bit about the different curves that you can generate. If I take the normal section at the point A and look at the curve generated by that plane and, it, and the intersection with the surface is that line. That's called the normal section or the normal arc. On the other hand, if I run down to B and do the same thing, I get a different normal section. They're not the same. They're not even the same length. 
So I have a problem in which one am I going to use for angle measurements? I got two, and I don't want two, I want one. Well, the geodesic, which is the green line, which actually does this, twists a little bit, is a minimum distance path, is what is used to define the angles. Now, that the geodesic is not only difficult to compute, it doesn't stay in the plane. It twists. And I keep pointing out all the way through, and I haven't emphasized this, that when we talk about distance in the real world, the distance from here to Salt Lake City, it's not the same kind of distance as we're talking about here. When you're on the terrain, there's lots of different paths that add up to the same distance. Minimum distance paths mean something entirely different. This is how you define angles. I said there were three possible definitions. Which one would you take? Naturally, you'd take the one that's associated with the green lines, even though it's hard to compute. However, the good news is the Earth is really big, and for a fairly short range of a few hundred kilometers, you can't tell the difference between all three measures. So it's common to use all three in different, for different uh, reasons. And I have the next slide. Now comes the real issue, which is looking at, <coughs> at that point A, there's the plane that's perpendicular. And this point B is you have to use your imagination. It's over that way in front of me. And I can't see it because I'm on the ERM. And it's down here somewhere. And I'm blocked by the curvature of the ERM. If I swing my plane so it intersects the base, I get the right angle. If I swing my plane so that it intersects some point that I can see that's up on the surface, I don't get the right angle. Well, how do I get the right one? Well, there's a mathematical process called reduction that does all that for you. A bunch of ellipsoidal trigonometry. So the definition of bearing angle depends on the Earth reference model you're using and how accurately you need to do things. Next slide. And this just, again, emphasizes over and over, because we keep hearing in the community the word distance used in different contexts to mean different things that as soon as you put an environment on top of your Earth reference model, minimum distance paths become very complicated. I've shown terrain here, and maybe shorter to go around a contour or a hill rather than directly along here if you've got to go up and down. Which one of those is shortest? Well, there's a lot of possibilities. And even when you're flying an airplane, what's the shortest distance? Well, you've got wind, right, that you have to compensate for. So. What is the shortest distance? Next slide. Now here are some problems we keep running into in our business when you don't understand the projections versus uh, geometric invariant transformations. We have to place models on top of some model of the Earth, in this case an Earth reference model, and it's not easy to do. I'm going to illustrate what the problems are by taking a steel cube and a steel sphere. And I'm going to take that steel cube and set it on a steel sphere. And it turns out I can only make it touch at one point. All unsatisfactory models of putting buildings on the surface of something. There's no terrain here yet. Once the terrain is put on there, you can dig holes and you can put things down and, and you may need to do that. Let's go to the next slide. Another problem with taking a which is what we normally have to encounter in our business. Somebody builds a model in an LSR space or a UTM space that's rectangular for convenience, and they build a building. And they want to put the building over on the surface of the uh, Earth model, or on the terrain skin. We start out with a cube. That's all the sides are the same length. All the sides are parallel to the various axes. I've colored the bottom of this cube, which is sitting on the surface of the Earth reference model. All the interior angles over here are 90 degrees. All the interior angles above here are 90 degrees. And I transform it. I use one of these mathematical transformations, and I transform the corners. So what does a cube look like when it gets over here? Well, the red points map to the red points. Are these angles still 90 degrees? Well, yeah, if the map is conformal. That's what it does. 
Are the straight lines still straight? No, they're not straight anymore, they're curved. What happens vertically is even worse. None of the angles are preserved in the vertical direction. That's why we, we went to the trouble of telling you that kind of distortion would occur. So you've taken a nice convex hull with very simple to talk about in a graphic sense, and you moved it over here, and you've twisted it and warped it, among other properties it has, it's not convex anymore. So the problem of what, whether a point is inside or outside gets much more complicated. This is a distortion just due to the coordinate transformation. Next slide, please. We need to fix this problem because if you go out and look at, see it, that Richburg has, Bob Richburg has out there, you, I, I invented these as possible ways of that things might be sighted on the train once you put the train on there. And, and Richburg saw this chart and he says, come on out, I'll show you every one of those in the real stuff he has out there. What's the import of this? Well, you think this thing's sitting on the surface and is embedded, but it's not. So anybody who walks behind this building gets his light shot off. Okay? That's not good. Maybe you would want to do this kind of thing. Now, here's a problem. Modelers have to decide how to embed buildings and other structure on top of the terrain. We can't do that in settings. We can transform coordinate points, but it, I've already illustrated, if you're careless about that, don't think about it, things are not going to happen that are nice. I'm going to be talking about vectors from local tangent planes. This is one of the solutions for this problem, that if we had a local tangent plane here, we could at least align this thing so it's tangent and, and reference to the local tangent plane, and then you can dig a hole and sink it as deep as you like and it'll look like a nice building on the train. Excellent. We have a real problem in a lot of the models in that narrow structures like causeways, roads, and things like that, carelessly modeled, don't meet in space. And so you have this point mass model, it's chugging along this road, it comes to a cliff. Now, it shouldn't be a cliff there, but there's a cliff because we segmented it, and the distortions that are caused in doing those segments cause the discontinuities. Roads don't need. Next slide, please. Can I have what time are you planning on taking a break? Well, we we're trying to finish this section and then we're gonna take a break. Do you have any estimates? Um how much time is more slides on this section? I don't remember how many slides there are left. You made a, a decision. <laughs> no, 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 in this section. Yeah, lots. Okay. We could take the break right now if that's so important. Well, it's published and everybody goes by that and they put food out and refreshments out and people do the bathroom break. So yeah, yeah. I, I this is a good place to break. So yeah, we'll take a break of 15 minutes. We'll leave it with a thought question. Is the latitude and longitude at the base of the World Trade Center the same as the latitude and longitude of the equivalent point at the top of the world? Can I have the next slide, please? Vectors in, uh, on the surface of something like the ERM are well-known definition. You just take the perpendicular at a point and you define a vector. The problem is if you stick vectors all over the surface, you don't form a linear vector space, and so you lose all the nice properties of vectors, which are cross products, lot products, and so on. Next slide. However, if we define a local tangent plane at that point and define our vectors with respect to that local tangent plane, then we can generate a vector space. That allows you to take those cubes that we couldn't cite and define them with respect to one point in terms of a local level coordinate system, and you can define those cubes with vectors now. And everything would be nice. You can have rotation matrices, vector transformations, and the only question is, how do you embed this in the surface? And that's a modeling issue. Go ahead. LTP, local tangent plane system. This is just a bigger picture of what Paul had. The local tangent plane, y-axis could point anywhere. The x-axis, which is orthogonal, to that. Next one. In order to keep ourselves properly in sync with the vectors, so the vectors are referenced to north, we pick a particular local tangent plane in which the y-axis is rotated to north, and we call that a canonical 
local tangent plane. A particular local tangent plane. Next slide, please. Now, in Cedrus, all vectors are unit vectors associated with a reference point, also called bound vectors. If you're over in an augmented projection-based coordinate system, you can define a vector at a point, x, y, and plane. If you're in a CLTP, you can define a, a vector at a point with reference to the CLTP. And the point is the origin of the CLTP. Now, I'm not going to read this whole chart, but the problem with vectors is vectors over in the augmented space have a north component. That north is not the same north as in the, uh, in the canonical local tangent plane. And you've got to be able to figure out how, what the rotation matrix is that rotates that vector to north. And that angle you need is the convergence of the meridian, which appeared on another chart, which we know how to compute. And so we compute the right rotation matrix, which I hope is on the next chart. This just tells you what the problem is, that the angle to north doesn't point in the right direction. And I'm going to skip this chart because you've seen it before. So that a vector over now in the xy space that has an orientation, that has a north component, has to be rotated through some little angle so that it points in the right direction when you get over to the other space. Why is this critical? Because you might have light sources or direction, directional items in, in the system, and you want everybody to be referenced to north properly. Next, uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. Can you go back just a second? This is the rotation matrix that you need to rotate with. I'm not going to go into details. You can get the sine and cosine without computing gamma, which is on the next chart. And I've got to show some mathematics. But I'm going to skip this chart. You can read about it in your free time. Go to the next chart and the next one. Using some differential geometry to get expression for that angle, tangent of that angle in terms of latitude and longitude, and then you can get sine and cosine from this quite trivially. I think you want to skip two charts. Let's see. No, not this. So there are all kinds of different projected coordinate systems. For some of them, the alignment is already correct. The correction is zero. For some of them, it's fairly simple. And for some of them, it's very complicated and expensive to compute, by the way. Can I have the next slide? Computational considerations. Accuracy, errors, efficiency, and testing. <coughs> Go to the next slide. Why is accuracy needed? We alluded to some of the needs for accuracy. Systems are getting much better. We need to. Um, this is a very key point and, and a little bit hard to understand. In the real world, weapon systems are modeled and aimed using relative coordinate systems. If I'm a deer hunter and I'm aiming at a deer, I do not call up NEMA to find out where the deer is before I shoot at him. I just put the crosshairs on him and pull the trigger. I don't care what elevation he's at. I don't care what elevation I'm at. Very simple problem. I either hit the deer or I don't. I could today call up Cabela, to go to Cabela's get a GPS system, and I get a laser range finder, I could do that calculation. But somewhere in there, I have to call up NEMA and say, how, how high up is that point over there? And they'll tell me, plus or minus 30 meters, and I'll miss. Okay, so I don't want to do that. However, when we're in the simulation world, and we're emulating that guy who's doing the, the gun pointing, I have to build a model that does that. I have to figure out where the bullet would went. I have to integrate a trajectory. I have to calculate miss distances. I have to be very precise when I do that in order to get ground truth, in order to get uh, a distance measure. If you're doing an application involving mission planning where real people are flying over, over mountains in the middle of the night in a fog, you don't want to miss your elevations too much. Or if you're trying to do some landing, in low visibility conditions, you want to find the airport, all those kind of considerations uh, relate to not only accuracy, but understanding the effect of distortion. Can I go to the next slide? This is my example of the relative system. If you're shooting at a target with a gun and you're sighting your gun in, and you shoot in rounds, how do you get the miss distance? Well, you march down the target with a ruler, and you measure it. Very simple. 
Now I want to simulate that. Go to the next slide. Boy, simulating that's hard. I've got to pick the coordinate framework. I've got to select some planes for the target to be in. I've got to have some random inputs to model my shakiness that I had. I have to put a time in that I'm going to shoot. I have to integrate a spinning uh, bullet in time. Horrible problem. I need air temperature, density, wind structure, a whole bunch of things. I will have to access a geodetic system in order to get that stuff with any accuracy. And then I have to compute by rather horrible computation the intersection of this trajectory with a plane in space, which is an iterative process. So if I make any errors in the calculations, I get the wrong mysticisms. And I'm not able then to evaluate misdistance models in reduced accuracy simulation. So it's very hard to simulate relative coordinate systems in the simulation world unless you're precise. You can't make mistakes or errors or approximation errors. Next slide. Lots of error sources. Did we mention distortions yet? A lot of these uh, coordinate transformations uh, don't have closed form solutions. They're represented in terms of Taylor series, and you cut them off somewhere. There is a truncation error. I will come along and tell you that I will approximate a lot of the functions involved with simpler functions, so they run faster with controlled error. A lot of times there are iterative methods. How many iterations do you take is an issue. Sometimes we just formulate the wrong equations. A lot of times, you've probably seen examples of this in the simulations that you've built, operating too near singularities. Singularities are not bad in mathematics if you know where they are. Doing calculations on a computer near singularities can get you in a lot of trouble. Just plain errors in code. Errors often are not, you know, it's so easy to, to have a plus sign where a, a star should be, and you can't see it. You can't see it in a million years. Round off errors have to be worried about. Next slide. We define error in terms of a position error ball. And in Cedrus, our requirement is to match the, the baseline solutions to one millimeter. That sounds like an extreme accuracy. It is. But we need to go for the worst case for all the reasons I described. An error ball is simply the, the difference between where you said it was and where it really is. Euclidean metric. There is some complications because some of the uh, uh, coordinate frameworks have angular uh, components. And so how do you translate that into position errors? It's easy. There's something called S equals R theta that gets you from theta type errors to S errors, which are distance errors. And you can translate everything into a, a position error ball. If you're trying to do an error analysis on many of the transformations, they have closed form solutions in both directions, so that makes it easier. Many of them have closed form solutions in one direction. They use the closed form to generate, you generate a grid of values, generate a corresponding grid using closed form, then you can do the inverse and see if you uh, end up at the right place. Some of these you can't do that because there are no closed form solutions in any direction, and then you have to go to other authoritative sources like Geotrans and do comparisons. And maybe they'll agree and maybe they won't. Next slide. Well, I'm going to speed through. There's all kinds of numerical methods. My role on this whole program is to make things run fast, so I'm interested in all this stuff. And the big driving force between in, in the runtime arena, I heard somebody mention they were interested 